Today I bring you a conversation that I had with historian Peter Kuznick about the history of nuclear weapons, the history of the use of such weapons, the threat of using such weapons, and the politics around them. Peter Kuznick is a professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He has written extensively about science and politics, nuclear history, and the Cold War. He's the author and co-author of a number of books, including Rethinking the Atomic Bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Rethinking Cold War Culture, and The Untold History of the United States. That, with Oliver Stone, was also a multi-part television documentary series. I began the conversation by asking about the genesis of this idea of creating a weapon that could destroy the world. Uh, Even going back to the late 19th century, there were some novels in which humans detonated atomic explosives that would, in many cases, destroy the earth or destroy cities. It was back in 1914 that H.G. Wells wrote his book, The World Set Free, which was the first full novel about nuclear war or atomic warfare. Uh, And it's interesting that Wells wrote his own epitaph in 1946. He said, God damn you all, I warned you. Uh, And so we, they knew that people had fantasies about the use of nuclear energy and potentially nuclear weapons long before. And in fact, some people argue that Leo Szilard should be considered the father of the atomic bomb because he kept trying to find an element that could sustain a nuclear chain reaction. And he even took out patents on it. And when he heard uh, Rutherford in England say that um, this notion of atomic uh, energy is the purest moonshine, Szilard went to see him at his office, I think it was at Cambridge, and Rutherford threw him out of the office. Uh, Zillard was one of those seven brilliant Hungarian Jewish physicists who left Hungary uh, in the 1930s. Zillard ended up, well, ended up first in England, but then he came to the United States. And, uh, and when the Germans split the uranium atom for the first time in late 1938, Word came to the United States. It was brought by the Danish physicist Niels Bohr to a conference here in Washington, D.C. in January of 1939. People had this idea, and now they had found that it was theoretically possible to split the uranium atom and potentially sustain a a nuclear reaction. And so uh, within days, people were writing formulas for the possibility of developing nuclear weapons. So right away, they understood that. But they, uh, the ones who were most alarmed by that possibility were the European emigrate scientists who had come specially to the United States. They had escaped from Nazi-occupied Europe. They knew what Hitler represented, and they knew what the potential was if Hitler developed atomic weapons. And so they tried to alert the American authorities. But the American military authorities said things to the effect that uh, this whole thing is unproven. Uh, Even if a new weapon was developed, it wouldn't be usable for probably two wars. So they didn't want to give you even basic seed money to do the original research. At that point, Leo Szilard threatened to publish uh, these ideas about nuclear chain reactions And they finally came across with the $6,000 that he and Fermi were requesting. So they began some preliminary research, but they were not able to get the American authorities interested in this. So Zillard and Eugene Wigner got a hold of a car and drove out to Peconic, Long Island on July 16th, 1939 to get to enlist the services and assistance of the world's most famous scientists and that was Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was off there vacationing and working on the unified field theory. He did not even know that the Germans had split the uranium atom uh, eight months earlier. This is July 16, 1939. And uh, Zillard explains it, and Einstein gets it immediately, and they drafted a letter that Einstein signed to President Roosevelt urging him to begin nuclear research project. 
It was delivered by New Deal economist Alexander Sachs. And finally, Roosevelt says to Sachs, says, Alex, I understand what you mean. You don't want the Germans to blow us up with an atomic bomb. And so uh, this is July 16th, 1939. It's going to be exactly six years later to the day, July 16th, 1945, that the U.S. tests its atomic bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, but the U.S. project starts off very, very slowly. And uh, and really, it looked like the United States might kill it. They gave it to Lyman Briggs, who was uh, the head of the, I think it was, might have been he was a, a soil physicist, 65 years old. He used to conduct meetings of the Uranium Committee the way that Ronald Reagan would conduct cabinet meetings. He'd need a few, ca a few uh, uh, jelly beans and fall asleep. Uh, so it went very, very slowly. Didn't get off the ground quickly at all. It wasn't until 1941 when the British Maud Committee's report came to the United States. And that report said that we didn't need 500 tons of pure uranium to develop a bomb. And we, we only need between 11 and 22 pounds of pure uranium. That made it feasible. So at an important meeting in October, the United States decides to seriously begin the bomb project. And it begins in early 1942, initially at Met Lab in Chicago, headed by Arthur Holly Compton. And there they do various research in order to prove the feasibility of a nuclear chain reaction. And they actually prove it in December 2nd, 1942. That, that the theoretical part of the work is in many ways over at that point. It becomes more of an engineering project after that. But uh, Fermi and Zillard toast in front of the atomic pile that they just constructed and proved. Uh, and they toast with uh, Chianti in paper cups uh, in honor of this. And, and Zillard says this will go down as a black mark against humanity. And he was right. And Zillard understood that from the beginning, but he also understood the importance of doing this in order to make sure that the United States had a bomb as a deterrent. And that's the important thing that people don't get. When the US began the bomb project, it was intended as a deterrent against a German bomb, against a Nazi bomb. It was not intended as a weapon to be used offensively uh, in the war especially not against Japan, who nobody thought had the capability of developing their own nuclear weapons. However, once one of the lessons is once you have such weapons, you're very likely to use them. And uh, But the other thing that happens in 42 that's so interesting is that uh, Compton tasked Robert Oppenheimer with uh, getting a group of brilliant physicists together who were called the luminaries. This was like Peter, like people like Beta and Teller uh, and the others. And they went out to Berkeley that summer and they began a bunch of deliberations. And one of the questions was, they, they came up with the idea that if they detonated an atomic bomb, it would have the possibility of either igniting all the hydrogen in the oceans or all the nitrogen in the atmosphere and blowing up the universe effectively. So they, they freak out the, the report, the stories. They look with these wild gazes at the equations on the blackboard, realize what they had come up with. And so Compton rushes out to see Arthur, I mean, Oppenheimer rushes out to see Arthur Holly Compton uh, in Michigan, where he was spending some time. And they decided that they should stop the research. They said it's better to live in thraldom to the Nazis than to blow up the world with an atomic explosion. So they stop the research. Then they go back out to Berkeley and they do more calculations. And Beta, who was the best mathematician among them, realized they didn't account for the absorption factor of radioactivity. And that they conclude that the chances of actually blowing up the world were three in a million. They said, that's good enough odds. And they began the process again. But the other interesting thing about this that's often forgotten is that on that train ride out, Bader and Teller went together. 
And during that train ride, Teller is laying out this idea. He said, oh, let's not waste any time with this atomic bomb. It's trivial. It's too easy. It's not a real challenge. Let's immediately go for the super bomb. What Teller envisioned was the possibility of developing hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear bombs, essentially the process taking place on the surface of the sun. And they would be of unlimited destructive capability. Uh, and the, the, the folks in the Mahan project would have a very hard time actually getting Teller to focus on the atomic bomb. The way a thermonuclear bomb works is that an atomic bomb is the trigger that sets off the thermonuclear bombs, the hydrogen bombs. And Teller knew that from the beginning, as did Oppenheimer, as did they all. Uh, they Because at the meeting of the interim committee, Truman asked Stimson, to set up the interim committee to decide about the use of the bomb and, and the consequences and other implications. Uh, and a meeting on May 31st, 1945, so before the bombs were actually used, they, people asked Oppenheimer, well, what can we envision in the future? And Oppenheimer said, within three years, we're likely to have weapons between 10 and 100 megatons. So between 700 to 7,000 times as powerful as the bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. And they knew that from the beginning. And, and the, one of the things, you know, the points that Oliver and I make when we're discussing this in our books and documentary series is that the murder of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians in Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a crime against humanity of the most horrible proportions. But the real crime that Truman committed was that he knew he was beginning a process that could lead to the end of life on the planet. And he did it in exactly the way that was most dangerous, most reckless, most insured to provoke an uncontrollable arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union as possible. And Truman understood that. And he writes in his, in his diary that, uh, and in his memoir, that when Burns came to brief him, Jimmy Burns, sec who later becomes Secretary of State, uh, came to brief him on April 13th, Truman's first day in office, he told him that we're building a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Those are the words Truman uses in his memoir. Not a bigger, more powerful bomb, a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. When Truman gets a full briefing from Stimson uh, and Secretary of War Stimson and Brigadier General Leslie Groves, the head of the Manhattan Project, uh, uh, he writes that uh, Stimson said that if we have this weapon, we shouldn't use it because it could end up blowing up the world. And Truman says, and I agreed with him as I listened to him. And then when Truman's at Potsdam on July 25th, and they get the full briefing of how powerful that bomb test was in Almogordo. People are writing about doomsday. Uh, and they assess, I guess that it was 18 kilotons. Uh, Truman writes in his journal, we've discovered the most terrible weapon in history. Quote, this may be the fire destruction of the in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark, the fire destruction the end of humanity. But Truman goes ahead and does it in the absolutely most reckless way at a time when it was totally unnecessary from a military point of view and reprehensible from a moral point of view. So there's a lot of background history here that we could get into in much greater detail um, that is just not known or appreciated. I, I want to ask you about that three in a million probability of starting off a chain reaction that could then blow up the entire world. Is, is that a probability that still stands today? Uh, well, I think we tested that one and it didn't happen. However, when they did the bomb test- Well, if you did a million times, would it happen three times? Uh, no, but if we did it a million times, we'll blow up the world in a lot of other ways before we have to worry about that. But when they, they tested the bomb in Almogordo, one of the things that shocked the physicists was how bright the sky was. And some of them thought they had done it. Some of them, their immediate reaction, we've we've done it. It's over. We've ignited the atmosphere. Uh, so uh, it it was it was terrifying, but we found out that that in itself would not do it. 
and even the tests, because we have done a lot of tests afterwards, and many of them were atmospheric tests. Uh, and they, we, fortunately, we never ended the world, but we're back at it again now over Ukraine. So uh, we still have that potential. With Ukraine, we're talking a lot about so-called tactical nuclear weapons. What what are tactical nuclear weapons? Well, tactical nuclear weapons, they like to talk about them as smaller, shorter range nuclear weapons, as opposed to intercontinental strategic nuclear weapons. And we talk about sm low yield tactical nuclear weapons. And that's what this, the Russians have developed and what the United States is working on developing. Uh, and so some of them are, most of the low yield ones are around one kiloton. The latest estimates are that the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima was 16 kilotons. The bomb that destroyed Nagasaki was 21 kilotons. For a long time, we said 15 and 22. The latest assessments out of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are more likely 16 and 21. Uh, the So a one kiloton would be one sixteenth the size of the Hiroshima bomb. There are some that are as small as three tenths of a kiloton. But there are some tactical nuclear weapons that are 100 kilotons that are six to seven times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. So these can be quite big. Uh, but the idea was that a thermonuclear weapon, uh, which can be hundreds of times the Hiroshima bomb, uh, would be too destructive. The fallout effects would be too widespread, and they're therefore not really usable. So the goal has been to create smaller nuclear weapons that could be deployed on the battlefield. You know, that's the insanity of this. I take students every year for a study abroad class in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We used to also do Kyoto, now we do Tokyo. And we travel with Japanese students and professors. And I used to find myself writing down the same information at the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima year after year. And that's that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. 1.47 million. How insane are we as a species? How many times do we have to be able to kill everybody on the planet before we're satisfied? And in fact, there were congressional hearings in 1954 at which top scientists testified about the possibility of developing a single hydrogen bomb that would be seven, how many times is it? <laughs> I can't even remember it. Something like 70,000 times the size of the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, I mean, insanity, the kinds of things that we're, we were contemplating. Uh, maybe it was 700,000 times. The number is too mind boggling to even contemplate. But we've had these people making decisions who, I don't know, who, who think that we can defeat the Soviet Union or China or Russia with nuclear weapons, and uh, that we should be willing to risk that. One of the leading proponents of that idea was Curtis LeMay, who was uh, head of strategic air command. Curtis LeMay um, was on Joint Chiefs of Staff. And during the Cuban Missile Crisis, LeMay said, let's, let's go and make, have a thermonuclear attack against the Soviets. This is the biggest advantage we're ever going to have over them. I'm sure, we'll suffer some damage in, in return, but we can wipe them out. There are people who think like that. There are people who think like that today. There are people who think like that in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. There are people who thought about that when the United States had the advantage after World War II, when we had a monopoly on atomic weapons. Fortunately, saner heads have prevailed. But not always. And, and that's part of the another lesson we have to learn from the nuclear age. This is Letters in Politics. And we are in conversation with Peter Kuznick. Peter Kuznick is a professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He is the author and co-author of a number of books, including The Untold History of the United States with Oliver Stone, which was also a documentary series. We are talking about the history of nuclear weapons. Staying with tactical nuclear weapons, is this is this a new phenomenon or for for a long time have the United States, perhaps the Soviet Union, 
tried and even successfully made uh, smaller nuclear weapons that that they thought potentially could be used. Uh, yeah, back in the uh, 50s, even, we had shoulder harness nuclear weapons. We had Davy Crockett nuclear weapons. So we had battlefield nuclear weapons that could be used. And one of the things that the United States did not know during the Cuban Missile Crisis is that the Soviets, in addition to the medium range ballistic missiles they put in there, had also put 98 tactical nuclear weapons into Cuba, battlefield nuclear weapons. In and Cuba. In Cuba, which we didn't know about. We'll get into the implications of that later. Uh, but yeah, we've had tactical nuclear weapons for a long time, uh, and they were always considered more usable. More usable, and that's the way they think about it now. Trump had a big fixation on this and increased American research into and development of more tactical nuclear weapons. But the Russians today have a, probably a 10 to 1 advantage over the U.S. in tactical nuclear weapons. And that's what the discussion is. Is Putin willing to use a tactical nuclear weapon? And what would be the consequences if he did? Do our treaties deal with tactical nuclear weapons, the smaller ones? Uh, the treaties usually just deal with the strategic nuclear weapons, Meaning the ones that one. the U.S. can launch against Russia and the ones that Russia can launch against the United States. So so these smaller ones are outside of the, the treaty, treaties that we're even sort of moving away from, aren't we? Yeah, we don't have any left. You know, under Trump, we got rid of the well, under George W. Bush, we got rid of the ABM Treaty in 2002. It's at that point that Putin realized what was up and Putin began a massive investment in Russian nuclear weapons. Uh, on March 1st, 2018, in his State of the Nation address, Putin announced that Russia now has five new nuclear weapons, all of which can circumvent U.S. missile defense. So the Russian nuclear weapons are in many ways quite modern and advanced. Um, so that was the ABM treaty. Then under Trump, we got rid of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF Treaty, got rid of the Open Skies Treaty, and Trump did nothing to renew the New Star Treaty. Fortunately, when Biden got in there, uh, we had a little bit of time left, very not very much time. And one of the first things that Biden did he extended the New START Treaty for five years. In that first conversation that Trump had with Putin, Putin said, we have to renew the New START Treaty for another five years. The potential to do that is within the first treaty. And Trump uh, puts down the phone, asks the advisors, what's the New START Treaty? You know, the, the ignoramus didn't even know what it was. Uh, then they tell him, and, and Putin says, well, no, I don't like that treaty anyway. Uh, I mean, so we almost have nuclear anarchy the, the, the entire scaffolding, the nuclear architecture for arms control has almost entirely been eroded already. And the, with the relations now between the U.S. and Russia, even if we avoid war uh, in the current situation and this crisis ends, there is so little trust between our two nations now that the possibility of no arms control at all uh, is, is quite real. So we are in a on so many levels in a precarious situation now when it comes to nuclear weapons globally and U.S.-Russian relations and U.S.-Chinese relations. The Chinese have not wanted to participate in any of the arms control treaties. They say, well, you look, you, the U.S. and Russia have more than 90 percent of the world's nuclear arsenal. China, which always had a no first use policy, uh, China uh, had, we think, between 200 and 300. Now the U.S. is saying that China wants to have a thousand nuclear weapons by the end of the end of the decade. So we used to be able to say that, I used to say, at least, and I do say, that there are two people on the planet who have veto power over the future existence of life on our planet, Joseph Biden and Vladimir Putin. Xi Jinping wants to get into that game too, apparently. And that's too bad because the Chinese have always been a force of restraint. Well, I wouldn't say always been a force of restraint. It's true that Mao uh, 
said to Khrushchev, if there's a nuclear war and we lose 350 million people, there'll still be enough Chinese that we can take over the world. So, um, and Khrushchev said, wow, I'm dealing with a, a pretty dangerous person here. And that's part of why the Soviets pulled their nuclear advisors out of China and stopped their support for Chinese developing nuclear weapons. So, but China, the Chinese of more recent decades have been much more a voice of reason and restraint in that regard. But all nine nuclear powers are modernizing their arsenals. Obama authorized a $1 million, $1 trillion nuclear modernization program over 30 years. We estimate now that's closer to $2 trillion. Uh, so the United States is hard at work modernizing its nuclear arsenal. What does that mean? Making its nuclear weapons more efficient and more deadly, more lethal. Uh, the same thing with uh, the Soviets have already done it. The Brits have, have announced they're increasing their nuclear arsenal by 40%. So this is happening everywhere. And it's, I mean, that's the insanity that we face. Especially there is no excuse in the aftermath of the scientific studies that went on during the 1980s when uh, we had America's leading scientists, Carl Sagan and others, from various research that was done on a, a on the surface of the moon and elsewhere, they began doing these studies that showed that even in a limited nuclear war, but certainly in a full-scale nuclear war in which the cities burn, it creates nuclear winter, which threatens the existence of all life on the planet. The latest scientific research studies show that a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan, in which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were detonated, burning the cities in both countries, that would set send five to 10 million tons of soot, smoke, and debris into the atmosphere, get into the stratosphere, circle the globe within two weeks, block the sun's rays from penetrating. The temperatures on the, on the surface of the earth would plunge to freezing in many places. Agriculture would be largely destroyed. A limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan with 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons could cause up to 2 billion deaths around the world through famine, starvation, uh, as well as the, con the effects of the nuclear weapons themselves, blasts and the fires uh, and radiation. Uh, but we don't have 100 nuclear weapons. We've got over 13,000, and they're not Hiroshima-sized. Most are between seven and 70 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. And, and, and so we talk about tactical nuclear weapons. The Pentagon has often run war games about limited nuclear war. That's a fantasy, that we can have a limited nuclear war and then we can stop it. Invariably, there's no stopping point. There's no off-ramp. They escalate. And the limited tactical nuclear war turns into a full-scale thermonuclear war. That's the danger. And are we willing to really gamble with the future existence of life on our planet? I don't think we should. What is your interpretation of what has been reported and largely seen as veiled threats from Putin of using smaller tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine? They're not very veiled. I mean, if we look at Putin's own words, he says, in the event of a threat to the territorial integrity of our country and to defend Russia and our people, we will certainly make use of all weapon systems available to us. This is not a bluff. He says, whoever tries to hinder us, and even more so, to create threats to our country, to our people, should know that Russia's response will be immediate and it will lead you to such consequences that you have never encountered in your, never encountered in your history. I mean, we've got a bunch of other statements by Putin, effectively the same threat. Um, and, and not just Putin, uh, Kadyrov, his close ally from uh, Chechnya, has said, let's make use now of of thermonuclear weapons, you know, of, of the of the tactical nuclear weapons. So, I mean, we've had others, there's a lot of pressure on Putin to do so. As crazy as it sounds, Putin has positioned himself as a moderate. There are so many hardliners to his right and ultranationalists who want him to throw the kitchen sink at Ukraine now. Many of them, if you look at the online chatter, many of them want the use of nuclear weapons tactical nuclear weapons. 
or a full scale assault and a full mobilization. Then you've got some on his left who want to end this immediately. And Putin is not the most extreme. When people talk about toppling Putin, they're more likely to not get uh, uh, somebody who's a pacifist. They're more not going to get Navalny. They're much more likely to get somebody who's more extreme. Medvedev, who we used to think was one of the better guys, you know, has been far more extreme in his statements than has Putin. But Putin has been ex explicitly threatening the use of nuclear, but he's not the only one. We have, for example, one of uh, Zelensky's closest advisors, uh, Podolyak, says the other nuclear states need to say very firmly that as soon as Russia even thinks of carrying out nuclear strikes on our foreign territory, in this case, the territory of Ukraine, there will be swift retaliatory nuclear strikes to destroy the nuclear launch sites in Russia. So he's calling for preemptive strikes there. Uh, Zelensky called the other day for preemptive attacks on Russia. He didn't use the word nuclear, but if you listen to what the Russians are saying, I've done some interviews with Russian media, and they say uh, uh, Zelensky's calling for preemptive nuclear strikes. I say, no, he didn't use the word nuclear, but you might, might want to read that into what he's saying. I don't know. So you've got zealots and hotheads on all sides who want to escalate this. And that's the danger. You've got people going for maximal gains. Zelensky says we're going to keep fighting till we push Russia out of the last inch of Ukrainian territory, including Crimea. That might be a morally justifiable principle, but it certainly is reckless from the standpoint of the current situation. And Putin obviously does not want to lose and is willing to do go to very, very extreme lengths and possibly using nuclear weapons. We don't know what Putin is capable of. I think it's madness. I don't think anybody should threaten this. But you have to put remember and to contextualize this, uh, that the United States has threatened the use of nuclear weapons repeatedly. As my friend Dan Ellsberg likes, doesn't like to say, but does say, uh, that the United States has used nuclear weapons repeatedly in the same sense that a robber holding a gun to someone's head uses the gun without pulling the trigger. Uh, but when? Every president does this. Whenever we say all options are on the table, that's a nuclear threat and is interpreted as a nuclear threat. And they all say it. And Biden says it. And Obama says it. I mean, they all say that. When they say that all options are on the table. Oh, on the table, yeah. And, and you know, I, I showed my students last night in my nuclear culture class uh, the par parts of the 1991 Japanese movie Black Rain, uh, that uh, the Imamura movie that won five Academy Awards and including Best Picture in 1991. And it's about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And the character there who survives the bombing says toward the end, when it looks like the U.S. is threatening to use nuclear weapons in the Korean War, uh, he says, an unjust peace is better than a just war. And, you know, it's a, I mean, that's sort of the dilemma we're, we're confronting now. Clearly, Russia is the aggressor. Clearly, this is an illegal, immoral invasion of Ukraine. There is no justification for it. Not that it is unprovoked. It has definitely been provoked by NATO and the West, but it is there is no possible excuse or justification for the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but I think we have to find a solution short of absolute victory for either side. And if we, that means negotiating to get back to the February 24th line, I would take that in a, in a minute. Uh, if it means uh, going back to Minsk II, I would take that in 30 seconds. Uh, but, you know, we don't seem to have much will to resolve this diplomatically by either side, which is why the situation is so dangerous, so threatening, so ominous, so precarious. But it reminds me what you mentioned earlier about either the late 1930s or early 1940s and the development of the atomic bomb of, of the argument of 
is it is it better to just and I'm not I'm not saying Russia is Nazi Germany, but but there was this argument you pointed out saying that um, there was those who would that, that there was an argument that it would be better to live under the you know the yoke of a, a Nazi regime than to blow up the planet. Um, and then that's well, one hell of a, yeah, I mean that's I, one hell of a choice, you know. Well, some of us face that, you know. Um, yeah, it's a hell of a choice, and it's better. It's interesting. Eisenhower said, "I'd rather be atomized than communized." But Kennedy said, uh, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, "I'd rather my children be read the dead." Uh, had Eisenhower been in there instead of uh, Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis, we probably wouldn't be here today talking about it. And Eisenhower was one of the hawks in advising Kennedy during the crisis. Uh, had Obama been in there, I'm certain that we wouldn't be here today. Uh, but Kennedy was did everything he could to avoid nuclear war. There were times, I mean, we have very mythic understanding of what happened during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that's partly Kennedy's fault. Partly Kennedy's fault because afterwards he spread the myth that the reason why Khrushchev backed down was because Kennedy stood firm and wouldn't negotiate and wouldn't compromise, and it was that American strength that sent the message to the Soviets that we were going to wipe them out if we had to, we were not going to give in. The reality, of course, was very, very different. The reality was Kennedy was desperate to negotiate. And there were many times in which he was the only one in the room who didn't want to invade. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were putting tremendous pressure on him. His advisors, including his brother, Robert Kennedy, who writes a mythic book, 13 Days, in which he you know, talks about himself and his brother as the two peaceniks. Maybe Adlai Stevenson deserves that, but uh, Robert Kennedy didn't. But and and had Kennedy gone to, done what they wanted and bombed the missile sites and invaded the United, the world would have been gone or likely gone. Uh, the United States was calculating, according to McNamara, that there were ten thousand armed Cubans there, and there are ten thousand armed Soviets and a hundred thousand armed Cubans inside of cuba and that if we invaded we'd have eighteen thousand casualties of 4500 dead he later finds out that there were forty three thousand soviets there soviet military personnel and two hundred seventy thousand armed cubans then he said well if we invaded we would have lost twenty five thousand people twenty five thousand dead back in 1992 on the 30th anniversary he finds out that there were also a hundred battlefield nuclear weapons, a hundred ta or ninety-eight tactical nuclear weapons. He then said, if we had invaded, we would have lost a hundred thousand Americans. He said we would have certainly immediately wiped out Cuba and very likely wiped out the Soviet Union, or at least thermonuclear war. You know, so the, you don't know what you're going to encounter, and that was one of the lessons that Kennedy and Khrushchev both drew from the crisis. They both knew that they had survived by pure blind luck, not by great diplomacy and statesmanship. And, you know, and they both were looking for every off ramp to compromise and, and to resolve this that was possible. Uh, and uh, so Khrushchev writes an extraordinary letter to Kennedy in October, right after the crisis. And he said, from evil must come some good said, both of our people have felt the burning flames of thermonuclear war. We can never let this happen again. We must uh, eliminate every conflict between us that could cause a new crisis. Uh, and, and he said, we'll deal with Berlin. We'll deal with all these issues. China will deal with all the issues. Uh, and, and Kennedy responded slowly. But finally, Kennedy does respond. And and in those last few months of Kennedy's life, and the year the Khrushchev gets toppled the next year, uh, they 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 do everything to push for changing the whole relationship. And Kennedy says in his American University commencement address, the most brilliant presidential speech of the 20th century, in June of 1963, 
he calls for an end to the Cold War there. And he calls for uh, making the world safe for diversity. Uh, but he says something very wise that I wish Biden would understand. And maybe Biden does understand it because he talked about an off ramp in, in that last statement. And he said, New Kennedy says nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. Uh, to adopt that course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. That's Kennedy's words in his American University commencement address. Uh, and then Khrushchev, who also drew the right conclusions in many ways, said to Norman Cousins, uh, and let me put out a uh, put out a, a, a yell for a, a new book that's coming out this week by one of my PhD students, Alan Piotrobin. It's titled Norman Cousins, Peacemaker in the Atomic Age. Norman Cousins was the, the citizen diplomat who went over there and met with Khrushchev on Kennedy's behalf on two occasions and helped resolve the crisis and brought them together. But Khrushchev says to Norman Cousins, peace is the most important goal in the world. If we don't have peace and the nuclear bombs start to fall, what difference will it make whether we are communists or Catholic or capitalists or Chinese or Russians or Americans? Who could tell us apart? Who will be left to tell us apart? Khrushchev understood that. When Khrushchev was briefed on thermonuclear weapons, a nuclear war the first time in 53, he said he couldn't sleep for days. And so, you know, Khrushchev and Kennedy, we're lucky. If we had Biden and Putin there in 1962, we wouldn't be here today. You know, and there is a pivot. There, there's a pivot that happens after the Cuban Missile Crisis. An amazingly wonderful pivot, but it didn't last. But Dean Rusk says, at McNamara's say, Kennedy was was serious about ending the Cold War and the arms race and the space race uh, and the Vietnam War. I mean, and you know, we could have had a whole different world had Kennedy lived, and unfortunately, we didn't. Do you think we're at a pivot now? Do Do you think this is your concern right now? The potential use, say, tomorrow of a tactical tactical nuclear weapon. Or, or is your concern more of this can escalate into a, a new arms race? Or, of course, it could be both or neither. I, I think one of the lessons that the world is learning is that Ukraine should have kept its nuclear weapons back in the 50s. Ukraine had the third biggest arsenal after the Cold War ended. And uh, they were given pressure and promises by Russia for their territorial stability and security and sovereignty. And they gave the weapons back to the Soviet Union, uh, and but the lesson, the same lesson that Kim Jong Un drew from the U.S. invasion of Iraq, he said the one mistake that Saddam Hussein made was to not have nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. If they had them, the United States could never have invaded. The same lesson that people say about Gaddafi in Libya, that if he had had those those weapons of mass destruction rather than give them up, the NATO, and the U.S. could not have invaded. Uh, in, in Libya. So I'm afraid that we are in the, more on the verge of nuclear anarchy. Is it in Iran's interest to have nuclear weapons? I don't think so, but certainly I can understand why they might see it that way. Is North Korea willing to give up its nuclear weapons on the promises of economic aid and removal of sanctions and peace on the peninsula? I don't see it. So I see more likely going in the opposite direction. You know, and 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 the other point that Putin made recently, he said that the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki set a precedent. Well, it didn't set a precedent for anything that's going on today, but people need to, you know, the audience need to know that the U.S. use of nuclear weapons or atomic bombs in World War II was outrageous, unconscionable. Uh, the there was no. The United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Seven of the eight are on the record saying the atomic bombs were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. There was no excuse for using atomic bombs. The myth that Truman spread was, with the help of Stimson and Comp Carl Compton and others, was that the U.S. had to use the atomic bombs in order to avoid an invasion, and that if the U.S. invaded, 
uh, Truman writes in his memoir, Marshall told me, he said, that we have lost a half million American boys and an invasion. And the argument that's made, and even Obama says this when he goes to Hiroshima in 2016, from the day he got elected, I was urging him to go to Hiroshima. And I was glad he went. And I was there too, because NHK Japan Public Television brought me over to do commentary. And Obama says, first he says, death fell from the skies in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Death didn't fall from the skies. The United States dropped two atomic bombs. But then he goes on and says that the war reached this brutal end uh, on, on, on with the atomic bombings. Uh, that's not what ended the, war, the uh, Second World War in the Pacific. It was the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. And U.S. intelligence have been saying for months that Soviet invasion would convince all Japanese that further resistance is futile and that they, that, that would end the war. Tr uh, Truman understood that. He said he went to Japan, uh, went to Potsdam uh, to, uh, to make sure the Soviets were coming into the war. He had lunch with Stalin on July 17th. Stalin assured him that the Soviets were coming in on time. Truman writes in his journal, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next night. Says the Russians are coming in. We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. He knew the Japanese were desperate to surrender. Truman himself refers to the intercepted July, July 18th telegram as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. The Japanese had known for months that few, that they had lost. They could never win the war. They were looking for better surrender terms. To them, the big issue was they wanted to keep the emperor. They didn't want the emperor to be executed as a war criminal. As MacArthur's Southwest Command said in a background report in the summer of 1945, execution of the emperor to them would be like the crucifixion to Christ, of Christ to us, all would fight to die like ants. We knew that they were that that was the big stumbling blocks. We had broken their codes and were intercepting their cables, and they were saying that repeatedly. Uh, so why did the United States use atomic bombs when they had two other ways to erupt in the war without them? By changing the surrender terms, telling the Japanese they could keep the emperor, by waiting for the Soviet invasion, or even by warning the Japanese that the Soviets were about to invade, which we refused to do. Uh, because we were wanted to send a message, a signal to the Politburo, to the Kremlin, that if they interfered with U.S. post-war plans in Europe or the Pacific, they were going to get this and worse and much, much worse. It's interesting. If you go to the official museum of the U.S. Navy here in Washington, D.C., and the exhibit that they have on the end of the war, I don't know if I've got it right here. I've got it somewhere. The exhibit uh, says that in the Japanese cabinet, there was almost no discussion of the atomic bombings leading up to the decision to surrender. The focus was all on the Soviet invasion. The Japanese had known, knew that the U.S. had fi firebombed about 100 Japanese cities prior to that point, before the atomic bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They accepted that the U.S. could wipe out Japanese cities. To them, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, as horrific as they were, were simply two more cities. What changed the equation for the Japanese leaders was the Soviet invasion. And they had talked about that in their cabinet meetings for months, that the mighty Red Army was now turned against the, the Japanese. And that's what forced the surrender. When Prime Minister Suzuki was asked on September, on August 13th, the day before the official surrender, why they had to do it so quickly, he said, the Soviets have already taken Manchuria. They'll soon be in Hokkaido. When they take Hokkaido, that will ruin, destroy the foundation of Japan. We must uh, surrender when we can still deal with the Americans. And uh, the Americans then let them keep the emperor after all of that anyway. Anyway, there's lots more history there. I'm trying to kind of try to do my... We, we do have the tyranny, what would I call the tyranny of the clock in, in broadcasting. And, and we, we are actually there now. It's, it's implementing its will. But Peter Kuznick has been our guest. Again, Peter Kuznick is a professor of history, director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. He is the author and co-author of a number of books, including The Untold History of the United States.
Peter Kuznick, I found that very informational and very helpful, and I thank you for taking this time to talk to me today. My pleasure, Mitch, anytime.